So welcome to our virtual program in conversation, Lauren Shapiro, Dr. Nissa Silbiger, and Dr. Shreem Rahimi on Future Pacific, presented by California State University Northridge and Bakehouse Art Complex. Thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Novoa, and I'm the Curatorial and Public Programs Associate at the Bakehouse Art Complex. Future Pacific is an exhibition of large scale structures covered in 15,000 pounds of clay, textures sourced from coral reefs. Over the course of a month, Miami-based artist Lauren Shapiro worked with pu the public, offering clay molding workshops to layer the clay over the subverted architectural forms. Through this monumental installation, Lauren aims to cultivate environmental stewardship in the local community and provide a platform for researchers like Nissa and Shireen, who work to pr preserve and protect endangered marine e ecosystems. I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, first up, Dr. Shireen Rahimi is an Iranian-American filmmaker, photographer, scientist, National Geographic explorer, and founder of Light Palace Productions. Shireen earned her PhD from the University of Miami Abbott Center for Ecosystem Science and Policy, and through her work, she tells stories about how we relate to a rapidly changing natural world. Lauren Shapiro is a visual artist living and working in Miami, Florida. She earned an MFA in ceramics from the University of Miami. She's an artist in residence at the Bakehouse Art Complex and her work draws inspiration from environmental research and data, ceramics and social practice. Dr. Nissa Silberger is a marine ecologist and assistant professor at California State University, Northridge. Nissa earned her PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Her research is focused on the interactive interactive effects of local and global human driven stressors on coastal marine ecosystems. Dr. Silberger is a principal investigator of the Silberger Quantitative Ecology Lab within the biology, biology department at California State University, Northridge. CSUN has one of the top marine biology programs in the country where students gain hands-on experience through their many immersive field courses and research opportunities around the world. The Bakehouse is a nonprofit organization founded in 1985 by artists for artists in the former Industrial Art Deco era bakery. It provides studio residencies, infrastructure, and community to over 60 local artists. Our mission is to address the need for affordable live, live work, and workspaces for my artists in Miami's urban core. For the ongoing and critical support Bakehouse receives, we would like to thank our private and public sponsors, including the Knight Foundation, the Perez Family Foundation through Crearte and the Miami Foundation, Miami-Dade County and the Department of Cultural Affairs and the state of Florida and its Division of Cultural Affairs. I'd also like to thank the Wiley Family Foundation and Ackerman LLP. Uh, Future Pacific is generally sponsor generously sponsored by Thea, Jordan, Jade, Alexander and Jonathan Mitzman in honor of Robert Mitzman's birthday and the family's interest in environmental protection advocacy. Future Pacific is also supported by the National Science Foundation grant to Dr. Silbiger, CSUN Silbiger Labs, with additional sponsorship from Mason Color Works and High Water Clay. Please feel free to ask questions or share comments in the chat box to the right-hand side of the screen through our Q or through the Q&A feature. Once again, thank you for joining us tonight. And for more information on Bakehouse Art Complex, CSUN, Lauren, Nissa, and Shireen, please feel free um, to click on the links in the chat box that'll drop in there shortly. So to get us started, um, Lauren, could you tell us a little bit about how you conceived of Future Pacific as an exhibition and what it involves for you artistically and creatively? Sure, um, I'm gonna share here my screen so uh, I can show you some of my past work to give you a little bit of a, a background. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm a, or my, are familiar with my work, I'm a ceramic artist. And in my work, I'm interested visually in organic natural systems and patterns that I observe in nature. And I use a unique casting process to make these geometric forms in plaster molds. And I use textures from the environment in silicone molds. And I like to build with these different elements in clay to generate modular forms that group together in organic ways and that remind me of nature's design. And I'm very interested in biodiversity and tipping points and I like to play a lot with tension and fragility in my work. I grew up in South Florida and I spent a lot of time out in nature and I had a lot of exposure and education about nature at a very young age, starting when I was probably six or seven, uh, 
I was actually a Girl Scout and that's where I met Nissa. And we spent a lot of time camping in Florida. We spent a lot of time in the coast, um, in the water. We would go snorkeling, we would do beach cleanups. We would participate in educational programs to learn about different ecosystems. And this has been a really big influence on the work that I do. And it continues to be the inspiration and driving force behind my sculptures and installations. So Future Pacific, um, that's one more. Uh, this is the exhibition in the Audrey Love Gallery space. Um, it was the result of a collaboration between myself and Nissa. So she received this amazing NSF grant to study coral reefs and was looking for a broader outreach component to communicate her research. And she had the foresight to reach out to an artist to do this. And she happens to know one who specifically works with the public to do social practice projects with clay. And um, I became this component to communicate her research to the public and educate them about coral reefs. So we conceived of this two year project, an artistic project that would include activations with the public to take place in Miami, in French Polynesia and in Los Angeles. And Future Pacific was this first activation in Miami. And so these are some images of uh, the 15,000 pounds of clay uh, that are on these architectural forms in the gallery. And here's a beautiful detail of those coral textures. I'm not going to tell you guys too much more because I don't want to spoil the film. But what I will show you is a VR presentation. So after this webinar, if you want to check it out and you're not in Florida or Miami or you can't go out, um, you can go onto this website called Kula and you can view um, the Future Pacific uh, exhibition in VR. So I've actually checked this out in an Oculus and it looks pretty cool. You can act, it actually feels like you're in the exhibit. And I think a lot of us artists, galleries, cultural institutions have had to pivot due to COVID. So uh, 360 video kind of became a way to document experiential work. Uh, I actually received an awesome foundation grant to do this in VR, as well as an artist access grant to buy some of this equipment. Um, so we shot this on a GoPro 360. And as you can see, it captures some really nice uh, details of the corals. And you can actually walk through the space and see all of the different structures in 360, either on your desktop or um, on an Oculus or a mobile phone. Um, so I was really impressed with the detail of these 360 videos. I don't know if you guys have seen too many of these around, but this is kind of uh, gives you a little bit of an idea of scale since the camera was about uh, four feet in height. These are large structures. Some of them are about 12 feet in height. So a lot of work. And uh, I'll get to the part of the video, which is coming up next with uh, Shireen, who I met when I was searching for a filmmaker to document the work that we were doing here in Miami. And she happens to not only be very talented, but is also ecologically driven and inspired by the ocean. She's a scientist and actually a master diver. So it just became a natural partnership. And we plan to work with Shireen to produce a more comprehensive film of the entire project in its different locations and forms. So even though the film began as a commission piece, it actually evolved into more of a collaboration between myself and Nissa and Shireen. So without further ado, Shireen, would you like to share your uh, beautiful film of Future Pacific? Thank you, Lauren. Yes. In these times, we've been so isolated and we feel so helpless. What I wanted them to feel was to feel like they were part of something greater than themselves. I think that's the power of art, to create something greater than yourself. As artists, we have the power to capture an audience. I felt that it was my responsibility in a way to use this power of art to do something about the issues that I see threatening our environment, especially in the city of Miami, issues that are threatening the diversity, threatening the beauty. And the idea was to bring people into the system so that when they came out on the other side, they were somehow transformed or changed. 
I'm hoping that by having this collective shared experience, we feel that we can have the agency to come together and help preserve this vanishing underwater world. The clay that I used in the exhibit was recycled materials. I began by reprocessing much of that clay. Once the clay was ready to be molded, we pressed them into silicone molds of coral skeletons. The molds were sourced from coral skeletons around the world, loaned by scientists and other specialists in the field. I wanted to incorporate different colors into the clay because while these coral samples in clay began as they're colorful and wide and cracked and bleached, which is mirroring what's happening with our coral reefs. After seeing the results of this project, I know that there's nothing that we can't do. I first met Nissa when we were in the first grade. We lost touch over the years and Nissa went off to become an amazing marine ecologist reached out to me with this opportunity to help communicate her research that she was conducting in the Pacific Ocean. My goal as a scientist is to uncover the mysteries of the ocean, and I do this to figure out how we can protect our precious coastal ecosystems. People can't protect or care about things that they don't understand. And through Lauren's art, she is giving people an opportunity to touch, to feel, to experience what it's like to be on a coral reef. And through that, you're able to learn. And through learning, you're able to care. And through caring, you're able to protect. Each and every person that will get to come back and see what we did together as a community, they were part of the process. They're not just a passive observer, which lends credence to this idea that we do not have to be a passive observer to what's happening to the reefs. for everyone. Great job, Shireen. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Shireen. <laughs> Thank you. So as Lauren was saying, um, the partnership with you kind of came really naturally. Um, could you speak a little bit about your educational background and research interests and how they relate to your work filming the making of Future Pacific? Yeah, so um... My background is in environmental biology. That's what I was trained in as an undergraduate. And um, I was always really interested in, in marine systems. And I did a lot of work with fisheries. And um, I worked in South America. Like, and I worked on fishing boats. And um, I was really out there, kind of like seeing real world, um, in the real world, how people were making their livelihoods off the ocean. And then um, I started my PhD at the University of Miami. Um, under Dr. Kenneth Broad and I was um, still studying fisheries and, and I was really enjoying it. And I, I, I loved science, but I always felt like something was missing for me. Um, and I had always been really into photography. My grandpa gave me a film camera when I was 15 years old and I was like so obsessed with photography. I was 
taking rolls of film like they were nothing. Um, and that passion always stuck with me. And I always practice, you know, image making, like visual storytelling. Um, and then just kind of as a fluke, I ended up in this program that I didn't really realize at the time, but it was an incredible program be because like, I didn't realize before I entered the program, but it was an incredible program because it was so flexible and, and the people there really supported me and what I wanted to do in terms of blending my passion for science with uh, my passion for photography and film. Um, and just by coincidence, while I was there, um, the school, we opened an environmental, environment, culture and media department at the school. And so I now had this support and this advisorship and this um, like team of people there to help me kind of develop my, my um, image, my visual storytelling work. And so that and then so I started, you know, incorporating film and photography into my PhD dissertation. I worked in the Bahamas and Cuba um, doing underwater work and trying to understand, you know, using film and photography as a, as a source of data. And then, um, yeah, I completed my PhD and I met Lauren and uh, it was like a connection. We were like, we want to do the same things. We care about the same things. Um, and I have the things that you know, I have like strengths that you can use and you have strengths that I can use. So it was perfect. Great, and actually we had someone that's asked um, how the footage um, for your film was captured. Um, do you wanna just uh, kind of- Yeah, so, um, well, I shot a lot of that, you know, with Lauren in the studio or in the gallery while she was working on it. Um, a lot of the more slow-mo kind of like ethereal shots and then a lot of the supporting footage um, was some of the, like I got a source supporting footage from Nissa and Lauren's brother, Aaron Shapiro and a friend of mine, Claudio, who came in and filmed. Um, and then a lot of the underwater footage I shot in Cuba and uh, the Dry Tortugas and in um, the Bahamas, mostly Cuba and the Dry Tortugas on a film that I was working for, for a grant for National Geographic doing underwater videography. Great. Um, so building up on this uh, passion for <laughs> marine ecosystems, Nissa, could you tell us a little bit about the science behind Future Pacific and how the exhibition furthers the work and the research that, that you're dedicated to? Sure, of course. So I'm a marine ecologist, like you said before, and I generally research how local stressors like nutrient pollution and global stressors like climate change uh, interacts to affect our many important ecosystems like coral reefs, which is what Future Pacific is about. Um, the project specifically associated with Future Pacific is actually focused on trying to understand how groundwater affects coral reefs in Morea, French Polynesia, which is this tiny little island out in the South Pacific. And for many of us around the world and many people that are probably on this call, there is fresh groundwater right beneath our feet. And in fact, in a lot of places, much of our drinking water comes from this groundwater, but this fresh groundwater can make its way into the ocean and can flow onto coral reefs through little cracks and crevices in the ocean floor. And even though this is a completely natural process, one issue is that it can actually act as a conduit for land-based pollution because there's a lot of human derived waste products that can leak into the groundwater, you know, like sewage and fertilizers, for example. And so my research is trying to better understand how groundwater that flows onto coral reefs is affecting how fast corals are growing, how corals interact with each other and compete with other coral reef species like microalgae, and generally how groundwater affects the functioning of the entire ecosystem. I also work in other co coastal ecosystems around the world, um, such as like the rocky intertidal ecosystems along the west coast of the US. So those that like to go tide pooling, um, I do a bit of work there and different uh, tropical and temperate reefs in Bermuda, Hawaii and the Galapagos and a few other places as well. And so Future Pacific is actually a really integral part of my work and because I, I really strongly believe that sharing our research with the public goes hand in hand with actually doing the science. Because if nobody knows about what you're doing, then you can't really care about it. And as scientists, we are generally trained to talk to other scientists. So we use a lot of jargon. Our writing is targeted for a very specific audience that isn't well digested by the general public. But 
art's really different. Art elicits emotion and allows the audience to connect with the piece in a really personal way. And by using art to communicate science, we can inform the public about our research in a creative way and give our audience the space to connect in a personal level that's really just not possible by reading a scientific article. And so this was the, the main goal of Future Pacific. And one of the major reasons why I reached out to Lauren and I'm so excited that we also have Shireen to create film because one of the main goals of Future Pacific was to teach and to have people connect with coral reefs through art, film and community practice. And so I'm super excited to continue to work with these other women on this panel and uh, create more, po more projects that marry art, science and film. And hopefully we can reach and connect with new people that otherwise would not have been possible without this platform. Thanks, Shereen. I, um, sorry. Thanks, Nissa. I actually, um, you kind of touched upon my next question. Um, and maybe Shereen wants to talk a little bit about the relationship that you briefly mentioned between art and science and how art, uh, works to inform and express scientific research in a more accessible way. Like you said, um, scientists are used to talking to scientists and with scientists. So Shereen, could you just build upon what Nissa was referring to and how you think, what you think the relationship between art and science? is yeah i i mean nissa said it really beautifully like there's a connection that we can develop with art that isn't as easy to develop with science especially if you're not a scientist and so um and you know in terms of my own uh field filmmaking photography um i truly believe that uh visual media um are the most powerful tool that we have to communicate science, to communicate the knowledge that we have, and to drive social and behavioral and political change around these really big issues. Um, and I think that's why it's so important because it's only when you bring these things together, like we need the science we, and we need the art and we need the film. And without any one of those, the other is doomed. And so I feel like it's so important because if we use film to communicate science, then we can really like drive serious like actual real life changes um, that impact the lives of real people that are dealing with real issues. You know, like our seas are rising, our fish are dying um, and these things won't change unless we figure out a way to get to people. And just now like looking in the chat, people are saying, you know, I feel such a deep connection to this after watching this film or after seeing this art. Um, and that's like, that's real, that's really important. Um, Lauren. Do you want to speak a little bit about that as well and maybe tell us why you feel that collaborating on projects like Future Pacific is an important way to engage the community and call attention to topics like climate change, um, sea level rise, et cetera. Sure. <laughs> You know, thinking about having an exhibition about climate change, you, you, it would make someone run maybe in the other direction. But if there's a way to have people engage with the work, which is why I think these social practice clay activations are so unique in that I think science sometimes is inaccessible to the public as Nissa has touched on and that it's, you know, the jargon and the language and a lot of that more, more science mathematical data is not very emotional, but also art can be that way as well. Sometimes people, if you're not an art person, you go into a museum and you see a pile of sand on the floor, you have no idea what it means. And sometimes you can't touch the art, you're, you're trained not to, there's a barrier. So not here with this exhibition, not only are people encouraged to touch, but they're actually participating in creating something. And so even though we're talking about a lot of ruin here, these ruins of corals that collectively as a community, we're actually building something together. And there's no way that I could have ever done this without the help of all the participants that came and lended a hand to building this exhibition. Um, and in addition, the film capturing it, there's no way the core of this project was the community activation. Even the end result is beautiful, sure, but it's really the community and the people that came together in that active um, part of the exhibition, which was the core of the project. So I think it's just been such a beautiful partnership. And as an artist myself, you know, learning about what Nissa does deepens my research because scientists are really great at collecting data and recording things and, and proving points, right? But artists are really good at getting attention. So as you touched on before, Shireen, that we can help each other. We, we have strengths where the other have weaknesses and vice versa. So 
collectively, it's just been such an amazing experience uh, for me, I'm sure for you guys too, but for the community that participated in the making of the exhibit. Yes, so Shireen, would you like to add anything to, to that, to the spirit of collaboration um, that kind of is builds this project into what it is? Sure, it's, it's been an amazing experience collaborating with both Lauren and Shireen on this. And like Lauren was saying, we both learn a lot from each other. So I am terrible at art. <laughs> and so I feel like I've learned a lot about being a little bit more abstract with communication in a way that we just can't really do with science. And I also really had a great time coming and helping Lauren and watching, watching people in the community build this piece together and having conversations with them and, and hearing them, you know, having never seen a coral before in their life. And now they're touching this mold of a coral and they're putting it on and they're learning about the coral as they're doing it. And um, I, I think that this is gonna be something that hopefully we can continue to do like throughout our careers and, um, you know, take these exhibits to different places all over the world and help people learn about their local ecosystem, but not only what's in their backyard, but the ecosystems in different places as well. So I, I have had, I've learned a lot from this experience myself, and I'm really appreciative that I have these fantastic colleagues to, to share that with. Yeah, I think you guys covered the feelings that I feel, so I won't say much, but um, I'm, it's just super inspiring to work with other, you know, women who care as much about, you know, the same things I care about and also like care about other people and our environment so deeply. I mean, this is riding on a clipboard underwater, <laughs> you know, like that's so cool. Pretty cool. And, and Lauren just blows my mind every day with her ideas. She'll just be like random idea and it's the best idea. So you both help me think outside the box and stretch my brain. And I've been super inspired. So I think that's the evolution too. Like Nissa helped me put on the last texture. <laughs> <laughs> Nissa lives in LA and I'm in Miami. So she kind of got to come in at the very beginning and at the very end. And so like together we put on the last, it was very Girl Scouts of us. Yes, we had a lot of exposure, <laughs> a lot of exposure to art as a child too, through the Girl Scouts as, as we did science and nature. So it kind of, you know, you really did think outside of the box, thinking of an artist as a scientist, as an educational outreach component. Usually scientists would think maybe a school or a class or something, but you also had access to someone who's doing this sorts of things. So it was very serendipitous and amazing. So it, it seems that this collaboration between the three of you is kind of just beginning. Um, so Lauren and um, Nessa and Shreen, feel free to chime in. What is the future of, of Future Pacific? <laughs> what would the next iteration of this exhibition or this collaboration look like? I'll, I'll go first. Um, so initially we were going to, this was a two year project, right? Initially I was supposed to go to Maria with Nissa. I was gonna cast all of the skeletons and components of her research and bring it back to the States to do an activation in Miami and then in LA. Um, since you can't really bring actual specimens across international waters. And of course the pandemic happened and the only thing we did for her grant, I think really this year, besides you going out one time at the end of the year to start your research was this exhibition, which is monumental. And I went to, I went to her school and did a workshop for her students to teach them mold making in March, at the end of March. And, ever, and I got home the day it shut down, everything shut down. So. Her students actually were able to, I taught them how to do it. We did a virtual workshop with them and they actually sent me some molds of Pacific species to include in the exhibition here. She connected me with a lot of scientists locally at UM and NOAA, um, grad students, and a lot of different people that donated uh, coral skeletons so that we could cast them. So we ended up kind of doing it a little backwards. Typically, I thought I would go out to your site, see what was going on, digest it, come back and make art about it. But instead, I just kind of interpreted it. And I made something so massive. I think it would never have been possible without all the support we received here. So I think we're, we're going about it in a little bit of a different way since our funding is not as great as we had for this exhibition. And we're thinking about going to Maria to do an activation and using technology to bring these structures in AR. Um, and possibly showing the, you have a group of students, right? That we're working with in Maria and a community center. Yes. So we're trying to think of how can we bring an artwork to Maria and activation without creating garbage or waste 
or you know, with on a very limited budget. And so Shireen and I have been playing with uh, 3D scans of these structures, and we thought how interesting it would be to incorporate these sort of 3D scans um, uh, and show the students out there what it would look like. And I'll share one with you right now. Um, this is a shot that a friend took of mine on her iPhone. And this is how amazing technology is these days. I mean, it's very uh, limited because it's shot on an iPhone, but you could actually take this in AR on your phone and point it at your backyard and this thing would materialize into your backyard, um, which is pretty amazing. I'll share one more. And Shireen, in, in my mind, is blown by this idea to be able I'm to- I'm so excited by this. And bring these VR glasses for these students and they could actually kind of experience not only technology, but science and art on a level that doesn't create waste or trash or garbage. Um, and plus it makes a really beautiful film. So I think that moving forward, we're going to bring Shireen out to Maria with me and Nissa, and we're going to be using this technology to show students art and science. And then the third iteration will be a complete film, which will be screened at Nissa's university sometime in the next year or two. Um, because as Shireen touched on it, I think that art is great and it's amazing, but really what persists through time and space is media and film. It is the number one form of art activism there is. So that's our future, Future Pacific. Um, I'm super excited because media is something that I'm learning in my work and playing with my, in my work. And I think it's something that's gonna help Nissa with her research and communicate the amazing things that she's doing. And I think all three of us, is gonna push us forward. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I wanted to follow up and mention perseverance uh, for a minute because <laughs> Lauren talked about uh, very briefly how she came to do this uh, exercise with my, my, my students at CSUN literally one day before <laughs> everything shut down for the pandemic. And after that happened, I at first was like thinking we just need to push it back, we need to cancel it. But it's very different with art because if you have an art space that like Lauren received, it might disappear in the future when we probably weren't going to get it again. And so we basically took like 48 hours to think about it. And Lauren texted me and she's like, no, we're doing this. We're going to figure this out. And so I'm, I'm just super impressed to that, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, you know, try doing this in an extremely safe way, but still involving the community. I, I just like, blows my mind that Lauren um, was able to do this successfully and then to creatively think about okay well we can't get the corals directly from Maria so what are we going to do so I contacted some of the people that I knew in Miami we had like Lauren said like I teach marine ecology class and I had one of my labs be mold making with corals and so we pulled out the corals from the invert zoology laboratory and um, had them do it from the safety of their own home and send them over to Lauren and so it's been like this, this past year, it's been kind of an amazing experience watching watching this whole um, art exhibit grow into what it is today. So I'm, I just wanted to, to mention that, you know, relatively quickly. So I do have a couple of questions from our audience. Um, let me see. Um, so the first question, the purpose of the exhibit was to show the novice audience how human development impacts corals. Would it be more visually impactful if you had a set of healthy corals in the exhibit to contrast with the impacted ones? Who wants to take that on? <laughs> I can take that. I mean, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, interestingly, I, it was really funny working with, with artists who balance each other out really well because at first, this is called Future Pacific and I was like, but there's Atlantic corals in here. And it was like freaking me out. And Lauren's like, this is, this is abstract, like relax. Like, it doesn't have to be scientifically perfect and scientifically accurate. And so um, one of the really cool things about this exhibit is that Lauren incorporated color into the textures. And at the very beginning, if you watch at the very beginning of the video, the, the corals looked bright and vibrant. But over time, because she didn't um, fire them, they bleached and they cracked. So instead of it being healthy and kind of bleached and, and degraded on, the, on one side versus the other, it was more of a time series where it was healthy and then it degraded over time. And so there's two different metaphors here that I think are really important in this exhibit. So the first one is that because, because these corals are fragile, as the people touched them, like the chances of them breaking could happen. And so it shows that humans can 
you know, lead to destruction of a fragile ecosystem. But on the reverse side of that, this, this ecosystem was built by the community. And so it also is a metaphor for the community can come together to protect this amazing ecosystem and learn about this amazing ecosystem in both ways. Great. Um, let's see here. I wholeheartedly agree that the engagement with the public is incredibly crucial and the way you've demonstrated the connection between science and art is fantastic. Do you have, do you have goals to promote activism? What types of political or social change do you think will stem from this project? So, well, I'll just start. <laughs> <laughs> I think that on an individual level, that, that's been kind of the question, right? Does art really make a difference? Can it really enact social change? Um, I think there's a, a Mother Teresa quote that says, you know, skipping water across a rock creates ripples and that's more powerful than a huge splash. Uh, I probably totally botched that. But the idea is that... <laughs> um, change begins within, begins on an individual level, and it expands outward. So, you know, we, you can't change the world as an individual, but you can change your family, you can change your community, and so on and so forth. And so I think that the ones that got the most out of it probably participated in building the exhibit, but then as you all watch this film and you were able to take, be taken on this emotional journey throughout the whole thing, like potentially, you know, you might be changed in a way to start thinking about these types of ecosystems. And really our most powerful way of activism is at the polls, hands down. And, and not just on a federal level or on a global level, it's really civil. So thinking about your neighborhoods, the way that your water and waste is treated, are you composting? Are you recycling? Are you thinking about these sorts of things? Are you educating your children about these sorts of things? And so that's, um, I think, really at the core core of it all for me anyway. Yeah, and Lauren, um, Lauren has a bunch of great ideas about how we can continue this project. And, and one of them was that we could, you know, create a more complete version of this film um, based on, you know, footage that we get in Morea when we go out with NISA and potentially screen that film for uh, policymakers in the local places where we're filming. So Morea, Miami, um, LA and um, also to potentially take some type of iteration of Future Pacific to a landlocked state, maybe somewhere like Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and do a screening and do a, like a, um, a like community outreach, um, some type of you know, our activation to kind of like bring this message of the reefs to a place that doesn't necessarily have exposure to an ecosystem like that. It does have a lot of fracking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would be a terrific experiment. Uh -huh. The response here was really strong because, as in Miami, we are coastal, so people are aware of reefs and they understand. But it would be really interesting to see what someone in Tulsa might experience from this. And Lauren, speaking to community reactions, we we've had a question that asks: Has there been a difference in how children, teens, and adults interact with the exhibit, and which messages they take away? I think that um, people were, were really excited about, I think when people found out about the workshops and showed up, they didn't understand exactly what they were doing. They thought they were getting a class, but when they realized they were actually able to be participating in building an art exhibit, um, they were very excited. I think like the pressing part is very um, kind of production style monotonous, but to be able to choose the coral coral textures to choose the colors to add to the add to the objects themselves they felt like a little bit more empowered i think especially with like i know a lot of the teens really enjoyed it um it was just it was amazing to have to be in here with all these people spread out over amount of time and just hearing their stories we would talk about you know i went snorkeling once and it wasn't like it used to be here and we really need to do something and, and people just having these conversations that was really i think the fire behind it all for me anyway so it's hard to say what anyone really experienced on an individual level, but I found that either they were really excited about making art or they were really interested in the reefs or both. I think for adults, it was uh, like, a, or I don't know, maybe for everyone, but I heard a lot of like, this is very meditative and, you know, a relief, like a, a source of relief for me, like a stress reliever um, and a way for me to like kind of get outside my thoughts because at the time when the exhibit was being made. And also, I mean, I guess just like now, like we've just been cooped up. We've been 
um, you know, limited. And so it was a way to like expand your world. And I think people really appreciated that. Yeah. People are like, oh, this is so relaxing. I'm like, is it? <laughs> <laughs> You're like covered head to toe with clay. <laughs> yeah, I You're think like, all I want is a manicure. <laughs> right. People were really excited to be able to touch something. And we, and, you know, at the bakehouse, you know, we had the wonderful support here of the community of the staff. Um, and we made sure it was totally safe and we spread everyone out, which was even more difficult, which I means we can do anything after that. Um, but people were just really grateful to have an opportunity to come together in a way that they felt comfortable to collectively do something with their hands. Definitely. Um, so Nissa, uh, how does the installation compare to what you originally envisioned? Were you involved in the aesthetics of the work? So it evolved quite a bit, actually. So the, the first version that Lauren had come up with was actually like walking into an actual reef. So we had this idea of uh, life-size corals from Morea that we were going to use like GoPros to take videos to get this 3D image. And then she was going to print them on a 3D printer and then use that um, to create the mold. So that was that was the first one. And then, of course, uh, the pandemic happened and we weren't able to get to Morea. And so then Lauren came up with this amazing idea to, to create these, these structures. And I, I can't take any credit for these structures. These are all Lauren's idea. But I think that this, I think that this is better than, than the first idea that we came up with, like the, the finalized version of it. Um, I'm also really excited to, to do this in like a smaller capacity um, in Morea and possibly in LA as well, which was the original and we probably won't have an entire gallery like this, but even just doing this on a pole, you know, over time can give, give people the opportunity to partake in this type of exhibit as well. Um, so yeah, it definitely evolved a lot over, over the, well, not, not just a year, like from the time that we wrote the grant together, which was, you know, almost three years almost ago, a year, two and a half years ago at this yeah. point. Um, and, and yeah, what it turned, what it turned into, I think, um, is amazing and is just a, Testament again, like I said, to Lauren's creativity and perseverance. And Miss, we we do have a question that's asking if NSF funds research merging cutting edge AR VR with this type of artwork, um, especially after the pandemic and shutting down of exhibitions and art spaces. So, are you, Lauren, Shereen, envisioning maybe going out for another NSF grant to really follow more of this like future of Future Pacific course that you've that you've uh, mentioned. So I'm, I'm definitely hoping that in the, con the continual NSF grants that I, that I write to incorporate some aspect of this. And so, so far, since, since we've done this together with the three of us, every grant that I've written, I've put in some aspect of art um, and film in the broader outreach component, because I think that this has been immensely successful and it's reached a large audience. Like it took, how many months did it take to build uh, this again, Lauren? Um, to, to not just conceptualize but physically yeah, just to build it two months i think okay and so there were 300 people that touched the clay over those two months or, so or not including like friends family and the amazing artists here that came and saved me at the end right. so there was at least 300 people that touched it it's open until may for um social distance uh visits and then we had 200 people sign up to register for this and you know, hopefully there will be more that interact with it. So our, our, our reach is really broad on the order of, you know, 500 or so people at least that have directly um, interacted with, with this art. So, so yeah, the short answer is yes, I'm going to continue to write in um, aspects of this. And then I think the VR part is even cooler because um, even though the art exhibit is amazing, um, only people that are in Miami can actually touch it. But creating the, the, the VR aspect of it brings it, like Lauren said, into your own backyard, into your own home. And so it can make this, this uh, localized exhibit actually global and have um, a much wider reach than even um, we had anticipated at the beginning. Great, I'm excited. For Yay. <laughs> um, so I guess to just uh, finish, um, we have a question, what's next for everyone? question mark do exclamation points <laughs> <laughs> well I guess we're going to try to get out to Maria, right what's yeah your, what's your game plan Nissa yeah I mean you know assuming that uh, uh 
things uh, continue on the downward slope as they are and, and vaccine production goes up, like we're hoping to go together in August and um, interact with the Atatia Center, which is a center that is um, for um, Polynesian youth and education. And so we can both learn together and connect um, with art, create some of the molds of the local corals like we had expected and then build on Shireen's film to make it uh, a feature from, from this four and a half minute film to something that's a, a bit longer. So of course the science has to get done. That is, for me, that is m one of my <laughs> main goals as a scientist. And um, yeah, so so hopefully getting to Maria next is, is the next thing on the docket for me. I second that. <laughs> we wanna go to- <laughs> Yeah, I think that's for all of us. We all wanna go there and, um, you know, like, really like bring this project full circle. I'm, uh, I'm excited to incorporate the technology. I've, I've been using um, technology in my work for the last couple of years with CNC and Rhino and Fusion and playing with uh, 3D scans of the reefs. Um, and so to be able to take this into media and film, which is not my forte, you know, it's such a tactile medium as in clay, to be able to do to use technology is very exciting for me. So I'm just ready to learn and play and, and try some cool stuff. And I know Shireen's gonna make it look amazing. So no matter what I do, it's gonna look great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have one it's true though. We did have our attendees ask about adding a haptic touch for remote touching. So that's I my uncle Mansur, <laughs> by the way. I'm a Mansur, shout out. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all the great questions. Awesome. Um, yeah, so um, thank you, ladies. And for those of you that are in Miami and near enough to uh, touch the exhibit without haptic touch technology, um, <laughs> we, are, we are open RSVP by RSVP Saturdays and Sundays until May 30th, so please feel free to come on by or make an appointment with me or Lauren, and we'd love to show you this uh, beautiful exhibition that we have here um, at the Bakehouse that is the work of these three amazing ladies. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Um, so once again, thank you all for joining us for this virtual conversation. Uh, Future Pacific addresses important issues around endangered marine environments, coral reef degradation, and climate change. We ask that you continue educating yourselves about these pressing global issues and that you of course vote for people that support environmental stewardship. So please feel free to reach out to us via email or Instagram or for more information on Future Pacific. Um, we're also always looking for new sponsorships so that we can bring these art exhibits to students and the general public all over the world. So if you are interested in helping us support some more art or science or film collaborations, please do reach out. So again, thank you very much for joining us and have a good night, everybody. Thanks everyone. I dropped the video link in the chat in case you guys want to watch it and share it. It's probably going to be lost soon. I'm going to drop it again. Maybe touch it'll, that be on my, it'll be on my website and the Bakehouse too. All of this will be so. Nessa, I think some of your students are wondering how you'll know that they came to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can download it. <laughs> got here. No, no worries, students. Okay. You're like, how will, how will you they do? Know? <laughs> so don't worry everyone students of Dr. Nessa she knows you're here <laughs> <laughs> you always know. all right lady thank you so much this has been this thanks has been for wonderful. joining us everyone thank, thank you me. everyone Mwah.